Hey, special educators, I'm Jennifer from Positively Learning. Welcome to the Special Educators Resource Room. If you're like me, you're always looking for ways to save time and streamline your work. That's why this podcast was created, to give you the systems and solutions you need to get your time back. Tune in for tips, tricks, and tools that will help you manage your workload and make the most of your time. Whether you're brand new or experienced, all are welcome in the Special Educators Resource Room. Hey, Special Educators, it's Jennifer from Positively Learning. This episode is all about writing present levels as part of our IEP process. Definitely check back on past episodes where we are tackling this IEP one section at a time. Now, one thing we are not doing is going in order. And by in order, I'm referring to the IEP meeting agenda, what happens at the very beginning of the meeting, going in order all the way to the closing. Now that does bring me to my first question for you. When you are sitting down to draft an IEP in preparation for a meeting, where do you begin? Do you begin at the very beginning of the IEP and work your way through, or is there another order? And is there a correct way to do it? Now, of course, I'm sitting here and can't hear your answers, but I will share my own experience. I will fully admit my first few years of writing IEPs, I wasn't starting with the present levels. In fact, I was usually more focused in on the goals and then the accommodations. And it made sense to me at the time. It was often a student I was working very closely with. And through progress monitoring, I was thinking about what goals and supplementary aids and services would make sense to support that student. And present levels ended up often being an afterthought. Oh yeah, let me fill that in. I was approaching it as a template. Now, there is nothing wrong with using a template. In fact, it can be really helpful to make sure you have all the information that you need. I'm not sure what happened to make me make that big switch, but I'm glad I did. And I soon realized that I do want to start with the present levels and all of the information it provides because that information is what is going to drive the rest of the IEP. So what exactly are the present levels? Well, we are in special education, so there are definitely many acronyms. You may hear this referred to as the PLAP, the Present Levels of Academic Performance, or the PLAFP, (laughs) Present Levels of Academics and Functional Performance. I've also heard it called PLEP and PLOP. And it just can be a little different from school to district to state, but they're all referring to the same section of the IEP. For now, let's refer to them as present levels. Now, the present levels are often read out loud near the beginning of the IEP meeting, and they are located near the beginning of the IEP as a legal document. And the present levels serve as a foundation for the entire IEP. And this means that anything we're going to be talking about, say proposed goals, should refer back to information that was shared in the present levels. I think of it like this. If somebody is sitting at the IEP meeting table and has never met this child, they should have a clear picture of how this child is doing and what areas of concern there are just from reading the present levels. It's very important to note and this is something I wasn't too clear of my first few years. But as a special educator who's drafting the IEP, you are not responsible for coming up with all of this information that's going to be included in the present levels. But instead, think of yourself as a curator. You are gathering all of this evidence and information from all of the key stakeholders, using input from everyone who's working with this child, including, and most importantly, the family or caregivers. One last consideration I want to share before we talk about exactly what needs to be included in the present levels is that we also want to make sure that we are talking about what this student can do, not just what they can't do, but what this child can do academically, socially, behaviorally. And this information can come from both informal and formal assessments, as well as observation. And as we share this information, we always want to include as many details as possible. I just don't think you can have enough data. 
for the present levels. So if you know that behavior may be impacting the students learning in the classroom, we don't want to just say, this is what we think, this is what we see, behavior is impacting them. No, of course we want to bring some data, maybe a frequency tracker. Here's how often the student was on track for a set amount of time or how often they needed to be redirected in a set amount of time. I always think those numbers speak as loud as possible so that it just doesn't sound like a casual conversation or worse, a opinion. And if there's a specific area of concern that you want to make sure is addressed in the meeting, maybe it's the reason the meeting was initiated in the first place, you definitely want to include that data in the present levels that you can refer to. And this data should reflect the student's current levels. So this could be coming from test data, observations, the results of initial evaluation, or baseline data. Also wanna make sure we're using objective measures whenever possible. So we just did a behavior example in collecting data. Now let's switch it to academics. If you have a student who is struggling, say with reading comprehension, you want to have some specific assessment scores included in the present levels of where that student is currently performing. And it would be really helpful to have percentiles or other data supporting where we would be expecting our peers to be performing. And that way, when you are proposing a goal or talking about other supports later in the IEP, it will make perfect sense. There would be no surprise because we just highlighted this as an area that we were concerned about. The data that's included in the present levels will support that rather than just saying, the student just doesn't seem to understand what they're reading. We touched on this just briefly earlier, but we want to make sure we're not just using a deficits approach, but that we're also describing the student's strengths and their interests. And if this is information that you do not have as you're gathering all of this for writing the present levels, then at the IEP meeting, be sure to ask the parents or caregivers or guardians about the student so that we can just learn more. And this information can really help guide when we are making those important decisions throughout the meeting. Okay, so up until now, I've just been sharing sort of an anecdotal style of the things to include and the way to approach writing present levels. Now I'm just going to be listing off. You do not need to include all of these things, but I just brainstormed a list so that you can pick and choose what makes sense for the IEP that you're writing. Ready? All right, let's start with academic assessments. So you can be pulling from both formal and informal assessments. Now I worked with younger students, so thankfully we didn't have too many standardized tests at that age group, but we did take the NWA map test. So I can pull data from those areas. And what's really helpful with that is of course, there's information about percentiles and what grade level expectations there are. So that's information I can share on how the student is doing currently. I also want to include, whenever possible, some classroom-based data. I find that is so helpful because that's usually coming from the general education curriculum. So whether it's a unit assessment, teacher-created assessment. One year we used a big box curriculum and there were some diagnostics in there. Then you also may have some district level tests or benchmark data that you could include. We also did reading levels at our school. We used the step assessment from University of Chicago. So that was a additional data point. One unwritten rule that we had at our school is that if you are proposing a goal in a area or bringing up a concern that you should have at least two different data points. So whether it is something formal, informal, or classroom-based, whenever possible, have at least two. And I think that is a really great tip because we know if we're just bringing NWA data and it's showing something for that reading comprehension, I don't know if you've ever observed kindergartners taking the NWA, but sometimes I think that data might not be as accurate as we would hope. Another area to consider is looking at progress reports or progress statements, whether academic from general education teachers or if it applies related service providers. And then looking at behavioral data. Is there anything that's being collected at the classroom or grade level or school level? Is there any data you can collect? Is there any disciplinary data if office referrals was something that had happened? And we as a school always included attendance data. And whether it was 
showing positive attendance or not. We always included it and I think it was a really good idea. We could show if a student had outstanding attendance, we could rule that out as something that was impacting their instructional time or just the opposite. If they were missing key pieces of instruction, we could not necessarily prove that they were there to receive their education. So that was really important information. Another area to consider is any health-related concerns. That could be vision, it could be asthma. There was one year that we had our school nurse attend several meetings and bringing data about different office nurse visits, and it was so helpful to have that information. We do want to include students' strengths, students' interests, and areas of concern in the present levels. If it applies, we want to state the student's disability and we want to discuss the impact of that disability on progress within the general education setting. All right, so that's a lot. You are still listening. Thank you very much. Maybe you were thinking, great, I wasn't feeling overwhelmed before, but now I sure am. And I do fully agree. It is a lot. And I tend to bring more data than I probably need. But I just don't want any surprises at the IEP meeting table. If I know that I really want to bring up a goal or area of concern or a supplementary aid that would be appropriate or an accommodation, I want to have evidence to support that because that's going to make the rest of the meeting and the important decisions we're making go so much smoother. Now, there are some ways to make this a little bit easier. I am a huge fan of using cheat sheets or templates to save time, and I also highly recommend plagiarizing. Now, not plagiarizing other people, but plagiarizing yourself. So I did not have a model to refer to for present levels. So I sat down and I spent quite a bit of time, a couple of hours, writing the best present levels that I could, including all of the information. I then asked for some feedback, made some tweaks to improve it. And I came out with a pretty good finished product. Then I turned it into a template. What I did is I took out the identifying information and I had a fill in the blank template. Basically, I just was plagiarizing myself every time I sat down to do a new present levels. And it not only saved me time, but I also think it just made it a better document because I had spent so much time initially, I had all the information, probably more information than we've ever considered putting in. But that way, when it was a template, I could use it almost like a checklist just to make sure I've got it all in there. I did put an example, a few examples of present levels, um, template styles in the big special educators bundle. But hopefully you may have a model that's provided to you at your school or district. And I'll be sure to put some links in the show notes. I have a blog post all about writing present levels and you can get all of the details in one place. As we close, I want to mention again, because it is so important, that as the special educator drafting the IEP, the sole responsibility of writing the present levels and going into the classroom and collecting all of the data is not only your responsibility. It is a team effort. Think of it as you are the gatherer of information or the curator. An uh, art curator at a museum has a lot of background knowledge about art history, but they're not necessarily painting the pictures. Instead, they are gathering up all of those masterpieces, making a display for the general public to come and enjoy and get information from. That's what your role is with present levels. So what you could do to make it a little bit easier is have some draft emails. And 10 days or two weeks out from the meeting, you could send those emails to everyone that it applies to, related service providers, general education teachers, asking them for that data, return it to you, so that you can curate that information when you're writing the present levels. What we don't want is a scramble to get in the classroom and collect data. That wouldn't even necessarily be the best information if it was all on your shoulders. Instead, we want that more holistic approach to writing those present levels. So it is a team effort and you are spearheading it, but it is not your job to write it from start to finish. 
I hope that is helpful to you. Please let me know what you think. I would appreciate the feedback and you'll have to let me know which section of the IEP should we tackle next. Until then, take care. Thanks so much for tuning in and I'm dying to ask, what'd you think? Be sure to hit the follow or subscribe button so that you never miss an episode. You can find the show notes and links for everything mentioned in this episode at PositivelyLearningBlog.com. See you next week for more special education solutions.